Okay, welcome everybody. This is a course on gravitational waves. And I think in the beginning I have to explain two things. First, why do we do it in English? And second, why is it recorded? The reason is that this course addresses two different groups of, um, uh, uh, of participants. One is master students here in Bremen. I think that's more or less everybody here in the room. The other group is PhD students in our graduate and colleague research training group. And since some of them are not in Bremen, but rather in Oldenburg or in Bielefeld, so they cannot shuttle twice a week to Bremen, we record it and make it available to them in this way. I think this is also of advantage for, for you, because if you miss a lecture, then you can, can, uh, can see the recording afterwards. Or if you want to um, look at something a second time, because you didn't understand it the first time, you can do this as a recording. Or if you find something boring, you can use the fast forward button. That is also quite <laughs> helpful. <laughs> Actually, I've sitting in many talks where I wished I had a fast forward button. <laughs> so this is also, uh, I think, of uh, advantage for you. Uh, so you are not in the frame. So the, the camera is pointing above your head, so you can uh, behave quite, uh, yeah, uh, uh, quite uh, <laughs> normal and <laughs> without any, without any restriction. Uh, you are also free to ask questions in German if you want to do so. I have to repeat the questions anyway, because I think they wouldn't be understandable over the microphone. So that's no problem if you feel more comfortable in asking questions in German. Okay, I've already said, uh, this, the second thing is that we have to do it in English. The reason is that some of our PhD students do not speak German, do not understand German. So that's the reason why we do it in English. I hope that's no, no problem. So uh, we are doing uh, on Monday, that's now, from 16 to 18 uh, hours, we do lectures. So this means uh, 4.15 to 17.45. Uh, and the other slot is on Friday, 12 to 14. There in the first half I will do a lecture, and in the second half a tutorial. So the tutorials will work in the following way. At each week, I will hand out some worksheets. And uh, we will then discuss the problems in the worksheet one week later here together. So my hope is that some of you comes to the front and presents the solution on the board. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So we will see how it works this time. So I will not collect uh, the worksheets and mark them. I'm too lazy for doing this. So we will do it here together and discuss them together. And then you can mark your your solutions yourself if you like to do so. If you want to uh, use this course um, towards your, your master degree, you can do so in the module astrophysics. So it is worth six credit points. So if you combine it with some other course, so that in total you come uh, up to 15 uh, credit points and you can do this. So and uh, the only thing you would have to do is to take an exam. Yeah, so there's, there's no, other, no other criterion. So as I said, I don't mark worksheets or uh, uh, I don't do anything, anything else, just the exam, if you want to take one. Of course, everybody is welcome if you just, or he or she just wants to listen. Okay, so uh, yeah, this is a little bit uh, unfortunate with these dates. I have looked at the calendar and I've seen that we have four dates where we have holidays. <laughs> this is Easter Monday, this is Pentecost Monday, this is Good Friday, and this is 1st of May. Yeah, so we will have four, four uh, yeah, double hours uh, missing. And I'm also planning some travel in <laughs> the course of the semester, so I'm afraid we will have to do uh, once or twice uh, an, extra, an extra date. So we have to uh, see if we can, can arrange this. Okay, so how is this course working? So, uh, as I said already, I will at the end of each week I will um, I will send out some uh, some worksheets. Uh, I will also send out written lecture notes. So uh, you will get this probably each Friday evening. I hope that I manage to do this, and uh, then in the week af uh, after this we will discuss uh, the worksheets here together. Uh, in the first week, of course, we don't have a worksheet, so I will uh, do a lecture in, uh, uh, on Friday from, uh, for, the, for, the whole, for the whole time. But in the rest of the semester, 
We will have on Friday only uh, half, half of the time for lectures. And so the tutorials will not be recorded. Yeah, so you can feel then quite, <laughs> uh, yeah, quite un uninhibited. And uh, of course, then we talk German and uh, we have time for, uh, for discussion, maybe in a, in a more relaxed atmosphere than, than in the lectures. Of course, you are welcome anytime to, to ask questions here in the audience. And in particular, those of you who are listening uh, to the recordings, they of course cannot ask questions here, so they would have to send me an email if they have a question. This is my email address. And if an interesting question comes up where I think that it might be of interest to anybody, then I will, uh, uh, I will discuss it here in the, uh, in the lectures. Okay, we are doing gravitational waves. This is, uh, of course, one of the hottest topics at the moment. I think if you haven't lived behind the moon for the, for the last uh, 13 months, then you have heard that gravitational waves have been detected, which is very exciting. And uh, actually, Einstein had never thought that gravitational waves would have been detected because he thought they would be so weak that they would never be detected. He said this several times. Now they have been detected. And uh, of course, this is... Uh, this is now a very exciting time where a new, a new kind of astronomy is actually uh, start, uh, starting. Yeah? So up to now, up to now, more or less every information we get from the universe comes to us in the form of electromagnetic radiation. There's a little bit of particle, of particles, um, yeah, uh, cosmic rays and things like that, but they are not so important. Uh, there are so cosmic neutrinos and so what and so what come to us from distant sources, but mainly it is just electromagnetic radiation. And now, as one uses to say, we, uh, have, we are getting a second eye on the universe, yeah, the gravitational waves eye. So we will learn about uh, sources which uh, probably would never be visible in any form by way of, uh, of electromagnetic waves. So we really learn about uh, quite, new, uh, quite new things um, when this gravitational wave astronomy has been established. Of course, this will take some time. Yeah, we have just taken the very first steps. But uh, everybody expects that this becomes um, uh, a very interesting and very fruitful new development. So uh, the discovery of gravitational waves was not the end. Yeah? It was the beginning. <laughs> there was a, well, what I'm saying is recorded. I have to be careful now with what I'm saying. There's a very popular and very well-known astronomer in Germany, astrophysicist, who has said when gravitational waves were discovered publicly on TV, my goodness, what's so exciting about this? Everybody expected this anyway. This was a waste of money. Yeah. So, which in my view, I'm sorry, is a, uh, something, is a, not a very intelligent remark. Then, of course, it was not the point just to demonstrate that they are there. The point was that now we want to build gravitational wave telescopes, that we want to observe new sources. And so, as I said, it's not the end, it's the beginning. And, uh, yeah, in this course, I, what I want to try is to to give you an idea of how the theory works behind uh, uh, the discovery of gravitational waves. So what kind of mathematics we know, we need to know in order to understand what's going on. And although I'm a theorist, I will also try to give you an idea of how these, uh, these devices actually work, these gravitational wave detectors. So I'm planning to spend uh, quite a lot of time on discussing really the, yeah, the setup of these detectors. As probably most of you know, there are two types of detectors, the so-called resonant bars and the interferometric detectors. And the interferometric detectors have carried the day. So LIGO, the instrument which actually observed gravitational waves, was, a, uh, was an interferometric detector. So this is now uh, yeah, the, uh, yeah, the thing where most people think that this is uh, the best way of observing gravitational waves. But the, the resonant detectors are, are still not completely uh, forgotten. So there are a few of them uh, still uh, in operation, and maybe they will uh, supplement uh, interferometric observations in some way or other. Okay, so uh, obviously, as a prerequisite for understanding the theory behind gravitational waves, is the theory of general relativity. And uh, actually, uh, I cannot uh, repeat a full course on general relativity here. Uh, uh, in the framework of this course. So I have to assume that uh, everybody has some basic familiarity with, with uh, general relativity. I will give a brief recap 
but it's not much more than just introducing my notation and uh, yeah, refreshing the memory a little bit. So the idea is that people here in the audience have taken some course on general relativity before or have, uh, have read something about general relativity by themselves. So uh, here in Bremen, what we usually do is that in the winter term, we offer an introductory course to general relativity. And then in the summer term, we offer specialized courses, which are supposed to, to build upon this general course. And this obviously is one of these specialized courses. So everyone is very welcome. <laughs> but I say in the beginning that if you have never heard about general relativity, if you have never seen a Christoffel symbol, never seen a curvature tensor, then it will probably be a little bit hard for you to follow. Yeah? So it is, the course is meant for people who have some basic knowledge. So, for instance, taking the course here in Bremen, which uh, last, uh, last winter term I gave, or in the year before that, Eva Hackmann gave the course. So this would be uh, a very good prerequisite for what I'm doing here. Or if you have heard, uh, uh, taken a course somewhere else or read a book on general relativity, of course, this would also be fine. But, um, yeah, but uh, I, cannot, I cannot repeat everything. I can refresh only briefly your memory. Okay, so much for the for the introduction. Anything about the, any question about the organization or about the yeah the way in which this course will will run? If not, then I begin with uh, yeah what I usually do: uh, say a few words about complementary reading. Uh, wait a minute, that's with E. I always have to be careful. Complementary reading. So as I said, I will send out written lecture notes of what I do here on the board um, at the end of each week. But nonetheless, I would recommend that you also look uh, yeah, for some, some complementary views on the, on the subjects. It's often helpful if you, if you uh, yeah, read also what, what other people say about a subject, how they approach a subject. So, uh, and uh, for the topic of gravitational waves, of course, uh, there, are, uh, there are many textbook on textbooks on general relativity which have uh, extensive chapters on gravitational waves. I would say every textbook on general relativity which has written after, have been written after, say, 1970 or so, will contain a section on gravitational waves. The older ones maybe not, because people at that time thought, uh, this, is, this has nothing to do with actually observable things. So the very old textbooks, um, Hermann Weyl or Max von Lauer or Peter Bergman or so, I think none of them mentions gravitational waves. Yeah, but some, a little bit more recent ones they do. And I want to mention three or four, which I like particularly well and which I would recommend for complementary reading. So the first is Weinberg. That's a Nobel Prize winner. The particle physicist. Actually, I, uh, uh, yeah, uh, this is actually not one of my favorites because, as I said, Weinberg is a particle physicist and he writes on general relativity from the viewpoint of a particle physicist. So you don't learn much about geometry. Yeah, the geometry is, is swept under the rug in this book. So for Weinberg, uh, the gravitational field is just the field, a tensor field on, on a certain manifold. Yeah, it's that this has something to do with geometry, that uh, space-time is curved in a certain way. This is, this is not so much emphasized in this book. But I have to say that the section on, on gravitational waves is, is, particularly, is particularly enlightening in my view. Well, that's a fairly old book. It's from 1972. So it has a, uh, has a fairly long and uh, detailed uh, section on gravitational waves, which I find instructive. Then there's, of course, the book which we call the telephone book, or the Brickstone, obviously because it has this, <laughs> yeah, this, this shape. This is Charlie Miesner, Kip Thorne, and John Wheeler. John Wheeler was, uh, yeah, one could say, the, the founding father of general relativity in the United States. And Miesner and Thorne were two of his PhD students, by now also fairly old gentlemen. Uh, Wheeler, unfortunately, has passed away, I think, seven or eight years ago. Uh, Kip Thorne, maybe some of you know this name. Kip Thorne was the scientific advisor of the movie Interstellar. Yeah? 
So this, these pictures of a supermassive black hole, they were designed after, after the, uh, the suggestions by Kipthorne. And he is also a likely Nobel Prize winner when, as we expect, the Nobel Prize is given for the detection of gravitational waves this year then Kip Thorne might be one of the, uh, one of the winners because he was, um, yeah, he was the leading theorist behind the design of this LIGO detector. And uh, yeah, Charlie Meissner is a very well-known relativist, now also an old gentleman, 80-something. We have had him here a while ago here in Bremen when we started our graduate colleague. Charlie Meissner was a, was a keynote speaker and it was very very entertaining and very enlightening to have him here. So this book is called Just Gravitation. So if you are working in the field, then uh, you, uh, you always come across this book. It's, uh, it's a very fat book. It's old, actually. It is from, when is it? 73. This is, is it called? Yeah, Freeman. 73. And there was never a new edition. Yeah. So it was written once, and the authors were so satisfied with it that they, they never, never revised it in any form. And of course, it's completely outdated in view of, of experiments, as you can expect. Yeah? So the experimental situation, the whole development of gravitational wave detectors, of course, uh, started about this time. Yeah? So there was uh, not much to say about this. But the theory is more or less um, yeah, um, independent of time. So you can learn a lot about the theory of gravitational waves from this book. It's a typical American style book where you have these inserts and boxes and track one and track two and these things where you have to, have to go back and forth in the book, uh, um, not reading it uh, page by page. So some people like it, some people don't, but um, it's the American style of a textbook. By contrast, a very U European, actually originally German textbook is by Hans Stefani. I'm quoting here the English version because um, I, have, I have some people uh, uh, attending this course who don't, don't speak German, but there's also an older German version of this book. It is just called Relativity, Cambridge University Press. And this English version ap uh, appeared in 2004. This was actually a uh, posthumous. Hans Stefani died, I think, in 2001 or 2002. He was one of these uh, famous relativists in Jena, in the GDR. So Jena was one of the centers, still is one of the centers of relativity. And uh, Hans Stefani was one of the leading figures in this group uh, at the time of the GDR. Uh, yeah, this is um, uh, yeah, not this American-style textbook. It's a traditional German-style textbook, then translated into English. So it's, um, it tries to be as basic as possible. So I think it's a good compromise between yeah, mathematical aspects and physical ideas. And uh, I think for most readers, this would be, would be appropriate. But I want to mention Louis Ryder. That's a recent book. Louis Ryder is actually, um, uh, um, from his own background, he is a quantum field theorist. He has also written a very well-known book about quantum field theory. But he's also interested in general relativity, and he wrote a quite interesting book on general relativity, yeah, which puts the emphasis uh, quite often on things which are glossed over in other books. So I think it's really a good, uh, a good addition to the existing literature, what he did in 2009. And it also has a, has a very good chapter on gravitational waves. And the last one I want to mention is the book by Straumann, Norbert Straumann, a Swiss, um, well, originally a nuclear physicist, but who has worked on general relativity quite a lot. And the newest edition is just called General Relativity. Uh, this is Springer, 2012. So the, the first edition of this book was, I think, from the 1980s, and then it was uh, yeah, revamped uh, considerably. So the most recent edition has little to do with, it, with the oldest one. And this also discusses gravitational waves in some detail. And I will give some more specialized literature in the course of the, uh, of the lectures for particular topics. 
Uh, the only other thing which I want to mention in general is the living review, yes. Uh, there is, as some of you might know, a series of um, online, uh, yes, of online lectures uh, which, are, uh, which are regularly updated. They are called living review. Living reviews, they exist uh, for many topics from general relativity and there's of course also one about gravitational waves. This is, oh, that's a difficult name. I have to copy this. Satya Prakash. Satya Prakash. And the other author is Bernie Schutz. He was one of the directors in, of the Albert Einstein Institute in Golm. He's now retired since uh, two or three years. And this is just called uh, Physics, Astrophysics and Cosmology with Gravitational Waves. cosmology with gravitational waves. Okay, and this is online, www living reviews. Okay. LRR 2009-2. So there are, there are other living reviews which, will, which touch upon some aspects of gravitational waves, but this is the one uh, which is uh, directly related to gravitational waves. I think I will mention one of the other uh, living reviews, one or two of the other living reviews later for more specialized subjects. So there's also one about quasi-normal modes, which we will also discuss in this lecture, and about other aspects of gravitational waves. But for the general um, idea, I think uh, I'll leave it with that. Okay, so much for the literature. And now, uh, I think I'll write it here. As a, uh, yeah, how do I say, contents. So, um, I will give you an idea of what I'm planning to do in this course. I'm not sure how much of it I will actually manage to do. Or if maybe we can do even a little bit more than I indicate here. So as usual, I will begin with a historic introduction. That's what we will do today. So I will start with this in a few minutes. Uh, then, as I say, I, as I said already, I will give a brief review of general relativity, just introducing the basic notation and refreshing some, some ideas. And then we will begin with something which those of you who have taken my gravitational, uh, my general relativity course uh, have already heard, at least partly. I did it uh, in the last two weeks or so in the last semester. Namely, I will discuss the uh, gravitational waves in the linearized theory. Gravitational waves in the linearized theory. Meaning, of course, uh, linearized Einstein theory. Yeah, just linearized general relativity. The linearized theory about Minkowski spacetime or about flat spacetime. Let me put it this way. So this is a mathematical formalism in which you can do already a lot about the theory of gravitational waves and which for most applications, if not for all applications, is actually sufficient. So you don't use the full theory of Einstein. As hopefully everybody remembers, this is a nonlinear theory. That's what makes it so complicated. Yeah? So you don't have a superposition principle. But you can set up a, an approximation, an approximative theory which is linear, and then everything is much, much simpler. And that's what we will do in this section. So we assume that we have approximately flat spacetime, Minkowski spacetime, the spacetime of special relativity. And then we have a gravitational wave as a small perturbation on top of this. So it, it deviates only, li only, only little from, from the underlying spacetime. And then we can linearize the field equation with respect to this perturbation. And we get the kind of wave equation, which is very similar to what we know from electromagnetism. 
So in this formalism, the theory then is very and is, uh, has a lot of similarities with uh, standard electromagnetism. And in this uh, theory, we will discuss the other different modes of gravitational waves. I guess most of you have heard about this. This is the so-called plus mode and the and the cross mode. Uh, and uh, we will we will see that uh, in this approximation, a gravitational wave far away from the source is essentially determined by the quadrupole moment of the of the source. Yeah. So gravitational waves are predominantly quadrupole uh, quadrupole radiation. In contrast to electromagnetism, an electromagnetic wave is predominantly dipole radiation. Yeah. There's no monopole radiation. If you want to produce monopole radiation, you would just have a spherically symmetric ball pulsating, but this produces no electromagnetic waves and no gravitational waves. Yeah? This is just uh, the static field outside. In the electromagnetic case, if you produce a dipole, yeah, positive charge, negative charge, and you let, let move them up and down, then you get radiation at a large distance, which is dipole radiation. This doesn't work with gravitational waves. For gravitational waves, you need a, qu a quadrupole moment which changes. So for instance, you can take a ball and squash it yeah, rhythmically. Then it would produce a gravitational wave. And well, this, this is the part which I've done already in my gravitational wave course. So some of you know this already. But in this chapter, I will go beyond this. I will then also derive, so I will not be satisfied with the fact that uh, gravitational waves are predominantly uh, quadrupole waves, I will really calculate how the quadrupole moment determines the far field. And this is something which I did not do in the course for the simple reason that it is not quite simple. It was done by Albert Einstein in 19, uh, 1918 and it results in the famous quadrupole formula. So I will derive the quadrupole formula here in this course. So this will, be, this will go considerably beyond what we have done in the GR course. And then we will really be able to calculate, say, for a, for a rotating rod of iron or something like that, uh, the gravitational waves, which are, uh, uh, which are produced at a, at a certain distance. Or maybe more realistically, in view of astrophysical situation, if I have a binary system, yeah, two stars which uh, orbit each other, what kind of gravitational waves they produce at a big distance. So this is based on the, on the quadrupole formula which will be at the center of this uh, chapter. Okay, then we have a basic understanding of how gravitational waves are produced and how they can be theoretically described. And then I will talk in greater detail about gravitational wave detectors. Here are the two types which uh, have been suggested, the resonant bars and the interferometric detectors. And uh, yeah, we will discuss how they work and uh, what kind of detectors already exist, what kind are planned. Maybe some of you have heard that it is planned to send um, uh, um, a gravitational wave detector into a sun orbit. Yeah, so it will be trailing the Earth at a certain distance and then orbit the sun, just as the Earth is doing. This project is called LISA, L-I-S-A. And uh, well, if you we are very optimistic, we may expect it maybe to fly around 2013, 2030, 2030. So I'm not sure if I live long enough to see Lisa actually in the uh, uh, actually flying. But uh, this is something which is planned for the future, and there are other other new new gravitational wave detectors in the planning stage some cryogenic ones where you uh, operate them at low temperature here on Earth and some other uh, interesting new techno technological ideas. So that's what we will discuss here. Then I will... Uh, <coughs> the, uh, I will discuss the LIGO observation, observations. At the, uh, in the meantime, we have several of them, actually, of gravitational waves. So there was this one event which was announced in February 2015. It was this big press conference which was top news here in Germany in the, in the Tagesschau, in the, um, in, the, in the news show here, uh, the main news show here in Germany, and which made headlines around the world. So actually the event was observed in September 2014. So they waited for a couple of months until they announced it because they really wanted to be sure that it is the true, the true observation. 
Then a second event was observed on the Boxing Day of 2015, so it's called the Boxing Day event. Boxing Day is 25th of December in the United States. It has nothing to do with boxing. It's named after the, the boxes where the gifts are, <laughs> are, are, are wrapped into. Uh, okay, so this is the Boxing Day event, and then we have rumors about a couple of further events which have not been officially announced, but um, actually I talked to somebody who got this, who was getting this information from, from LIGO recently, who said that there were 10 alerts, 10 alerts where uh, something was observed by, by LIGO and this was then sent to other to other astronomers that they could look for uh, for electromagnetic uh, counterparts. Yeah? If the same if the same object is also visible in the electromagnetic, so that's the reason why they send out these alerts immediately if they see some kind of signals. And um, uh, yeah, as I said, uh, there are in the order of ten such events uh, have been observed since um, uh, since September 2014. So actually, we expect now gravitational wave uh, events, uh, yeah, more or less at a at a rhythm of one per month or something like that. So that's the order we expect. And well, what I will try here to do is to uh, yeah discuss the, these things which are actually which ha have been observed, and to explain why we believe that they come from merging black holes. Yeah. So the idea is that these signals, these gravitational wave signals, come from two two black holes which came close to each other, spiraling around each other, and then merging. And in this merging process, they produce this gravitational wave. That's the idea. And uh, where this is mainly, the theory behind this is mainly work for, um, yeah, for very sophisticated analytical approximative theories and for numerical, for numerical investigation. I'm not very good in either of these two subjects. Uh, but I, I'm trying to give you an idea of how the evaluation of these of these observations actually actually work. And actually, German people were strongly involved in uh, in the explanation of these of these signals. Also, the person who observed this September this September event, uh, there were two young postdocs from the Hannover group. Yeah? So Hannover, um, the Albert Einstein Institute in Hannover is is one of the one of the institutes which is uh, part of the LIGO, LIGO collaboration. And uh, the, the event was, uh, of the instrument of course is in the United States. Yeah? So in this sense it was an observation which took place in the United States. And the people who identified the signal and then uh, started with, uh, with the evaluation, they were, they were in, in Hannover. Okay, what else? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, then in the rest of the of the semester, and I hope that there will uh, still be <laughs> considerable considerable amount of time left. I want then to go a little bit deeper into theoretical uh, things, gravitational waves in the linearized theory. We had this already. Linearized. Theory, but this time not around flat space, but about curved space times. Curved space times. And as a most important example, I will do um, uh, Schwarzschild. Yeah, so I will consider a Schwarzschild space time. It's a space time of a spherically symmetric object, in particular of a spherically symmetric black hole. And now we ask how do waves propagate on this background? So the idea is you hit a Schwarzschild black hole with a hammer and then kind of waves are, uh, are produced. And well, what happens is what you expect, of course, there's a damped oscillation. Yeah? So the, the system will approach uh, in the long term limit uh, the static Schwarzschild space time again. So the perturbation, this wave-like perturbation will die away. So this is something which was proven in the mid 50s by Retsche and Wheeler. So the equation which we have to derive in order to discuss this is a famous Reggio Wheeler equation and these modes, these damped modes, they are called quasi-normal modes of a black hole. So that's what we want to discuss in this section. If there's enough time I might also say a few words about gravitational waves on a cosmological background. Yeah, if you have a Robertson-Walker space-time, which is our standard model for cosmology, and now you put wave-like perturbation on top of this. So uh, as I said, if time permits, we might also discuss this a little bit. 
And at the end, the last section, I will discuss a couple of exact. So this was linearized around flat space. It's an approximation. Linearization about curved space times is also an approximation. But there are exact wave-like solutions. Wave-like solutions to Einstein's vacuum field equation. And I will discuss a few of them. So I would certainly do the, the Brinkmann waves, also known as PP waves. These are plain harmonic waves, but exact solutions, not in the sense of, a, of an approximation. I might do the, the Beck waves, or as they are usually called, uh, Einstein-Rosen waves, which are cylindrically symmetric. So you may think of a, of a string-like source which, uh, yeah, in a way is, uh, is, is stretched in a rhythmic way, then this would produce uh, cylindrical waves. So they can also be written down exact, uh, as exact solutions to the field equation. And maybe the most interesting exact solutions are the so-called Robinson-Troutman solutions. They, are, they really describe, yeah, in a sense, spherical uh, uh, outgoing uh, gravitational radiation. But uh, yeah, it's in a way, in a way, it is twisted so that this uh, this fact that monopole waves do not exist that this is circumvented. So they they go out on on spheres. So they the emitted radiation uh, um, yeah moves on on uh, on spherical uh, wave surfaces, so to speak. Uh, but but it's an it's an exact solution which is compatible with the fact that uh, monopole waves do not exist. So it's more much more complicated than a monopole wave. So that's a program, more or less, for this course. And uh, yeah, I hope I, I can cover all this. So then we can begin with the first section, with a historic introduction. Yeah, of course, everything began with Einstein. <laughs> But uh, well, when we talk about gravitational waves, I think one should begin with a special theory of relativity. So and this was in 1905, as probably most of you know. So Einstein, yeah, how do I say, invents special relativity. And special relativity is incompatible with the gravitational theory which existed at this time. The gravitational theory which existed at this time was Newton's gravity, which is a fine theory. Yeah? It's not a bad theory, by far not. It's an excellent theory. Yeah, people have been flying to the moon with this theory, and they arrived where they wanted to arrive. It's a very good theory. But if you believe in special theory, in special relativity, then you see immediately that Newtonian gravity cannot be completely true. It can, uh, in something must be done with Newtonian gravity in order to reconcile it with special relativity. Why is that? Newtonian gravity. Well, in special relativity we learn that a signal cannot propagate faster than light. Yeah, it is the, the, the speed of a signal is limited by the speed of light. And this is obviously incompatible with Newtonian gravity, because if you recall Newton's theory of gravity, you have a mass here, let's say m1, you have a mass here, m2. What is the force with which one of them attracts the other? The force is, well, up to a, up to a, dimension, a dimensional factor, which is not so important. It's m1, m2, divided by, let's call this distant r, divided by r squared, and then a unit vector. And you see immediately, there's no time dependence. Yeah? So this equation, according to Newton's theory, is true, not only for the two, if the two masses are there at rest. According to Newtonian theory, it would also be true if one of them is moving. And now assume that one of the masses is kept fixed, and now the other one is juggled. Then, according to this equation, the force, which is, can be measured here at this position, immediately feels the motion of this, yeah? because there's no, no time dependence. So the, the action works at a distance, yeah? without, without any, any time delay, without any retardation. And this is obviously in 
contradiction with special relativity. Right? I could use this as a signal. If this would really describe the situation correctly, if, uh, uh, if I'm in this position and here's a friend of mine and I tell them when I joggle this, uh, this mass and do uh, such and such. And this, this kind of signal would travel uh, at, at an instantaneous, um, yeah, it would uh, travel at an infinite speed. It would be there instantaneously. So as Einstein, of course, was convinced that special relativity was correct, and we are now more convinced than ever that it is correct. It has been demonstrated, has been verified by so many experiments. So it's fairly clear the one who has to, uh, the thing which has to be modif modified is Newtonian gravity. So in this theory, there is no wave-like propagation of gravitation, right? And well, what would you expect? You would expect that this equation has to be modified in a certain way. And if you think of electromagnetism, you get a, clearly, a fairly clear idea of how it should be modified. How is it in electromagnetism? You have a charge here and a charge there. And now you joggle one of these charges. What happens? It's not immediately felt at the position of the other charge. There's an electromagnetic wave going from one to the other. And according to the, uh, to the equations of, uh, of uh, the classical Maxwell theory, this wave propagates with the speed of light. Yeah? So it arrives only at a, at a certain time after the, the signal was emitted, and it's perfectly compatible with special relativity. And you would expect probably gravity is something similar. Yeah? Newtonian theory is an approximation, which is valid as long as the motions are slow. But if the motions are really rapid, then I have to modify it in a way that some wave-like propagation of gravitation would result. And that's what Einstein began trying immediately after he had established special relativity. But it took him 10 years. It took him 10 years, and what came out was the general theory of relativity. Einstein establishes general relativity. So the field equation, Einstein's field equation, was uh, presented to the Prussian Academy of Science in November 2015, uh, to November 1915. So in November 2015, a little bit more than a year ago, we celebrated this event. And at this time already, uh, since at least uh, the insiders knew since two months that gravitational waves had been detected, which was one of the most important uh, prediction of uh, general relativity. So in this theory, we will talk about the formalism in great detail in this, in this course. But I hope everybody knows that what happens in this situation according to this theory is the following. If I move this mass, then the space-time curvature in the neighborhood of this mass is changed. And so this perturbation in the, in the geometry of space-time then travels to the other mass. And everything is, uh, of course, uh, compatible with the, with the causal propagation speed. So we have no contradiction with, um, with the fact that relativity is, uh, uh, predicts um, uh, an upper limit for the speed of, uh, of signals. So in this theory, the equation for the gravitational field is a fairly complicated nonlinear theory. But uh, Einstein immediately began to simplify this uh, equation. So in 1916, he discussed what we now call the linearized uh, theory of um, general relativity, the linear linearization about Minkowski spacetime. And he immediately saw that this gives wave-like solution, the existence of gravitational waves. on the basis uh, of the linearized theory uh, uh, yeah, of general relativity. So he assumed, as I said before, we have Minkowski spacetime, and then the gravitational field, which we will want to discuss, is just a small perturbation on top of this uh, on top of this background. And then he proved 
on the basis of his field equation that this perturbation propagates with the speed of light in the background space time. Yeah? So it's the speed of light. We have to say speed of light relative to what and how is this measured? It is measured with respect to the background space time, with respect to the Minkowski space time. So this means it just stays on the light cones of the background Minkowski space time. And already in this first paper on the subject in 1916, Einstein said, okay, these gravitational waves exist on the basis of the theory, but they will never be, be detected. Yeah? This is such a small effect that we will never be able to detect this. So he, he estimated if uh, yeah, we have some, some star or something like that, that was more or less the most massive things which could be imagined at this time. If this undergoes some, some rapid motion, how big would the gravitational waves be, which would be uh, produced? And he said that's way too small for being ever be observed. And in particular, whatever you can produce in the lab, of course, is it's out of the question that this would ever be observed. In principle, you produce gravitational waves whenever you move. Yeah? When I move my arms, I produce gravitational waves here. But they are so weak that nobody will ever measure them. Yeah? And even if I take a big iron rod and swing this around, we can calculate later in the course how big the, the, the emitted energy will be if I, if I take an iron rod and swing this around my head. So this is, um, this is out of the question that, that this will be measured. Uh, of course, Einstein didn't know about supermassive black holes, uh, or let's say about uh, stellar black holes, heavy stellar black holes that could merge. And um, yeah, uh, that's the reason why he thought this would be, and in particular, he had no idea of uh, what uh, incredible uh, high precision um, uh, modern interferometers could, could reach. That's the reason why he thought they would not, not be observable. But nonetheless, he studied them theoretically further, and in 1918, he wrote this famous, or some people would say infamous, paper <laughs> where he derived the quadrupole formula. Why do I say infamous? Because it's so hard to follow. Yeah? And actually, it's, yeah, it's a mixture of um, heuristic ideas and precise mathematics, and then not so precise mathematics. So this was really, for a long time, it was a debate. Is this really a, um, uh, a good equation? Yeah, is this really established by theory, and of course nowadays we know it is. So Einstein had, as always, he had a very good instinct, and although his mathematical arguments maybe were not very precise, the result is perfectly correct. And uh, so Einstein establishes or derives the quadrupole formula. Formula for gravitational waves. So this is a formula which says that in a certain approximation, the energy which is emitted by a gravitational wave source is given by the time average of the time derivative of the quadrupole moment. Yeah, the first time derivative of the, uh, the, the time derivative of the quadrupole moment must be um, uh, uh, what did I say? Um, uh, you average you average the time time derivative of the quadrupole moment, and uh, this gives you the uh, yeah the emitted energy per time, so the emitted the emitted power. And uh, yeah, as I said, we will we will reproduce this this formula this formula later. So uh, this was uh, yeah the theory, theoretical foundation in a sense of everything. But at this time, more or less nobody thought about the possibility that gravitational waves could ever be, could ever be observed. And uh, for quite some time, it was uh, more mathematicians than physicists who, uh, who studied the subject. In 1925, actually, there appeared two very interesting, more or less purely mathematical papers where particular wave-like solutions were presented. The first was by Brinkmann. And this was largely unnoticed by, by physicists for many years. And uh, if, you read, uh, if you read the title of the paper, you have not the idea that it has anything to do with general relativity or with physics. It is just about a certain class of, of, of metric tensors with particular properties. Yeah, that's how the title reads. So it doesn't look like, uh, like physics, but it is physics. Namely, finds a class of plane harmonic 
exists. Uh, not harmonic, sorry, nonsense, nonsense. Plain, uh, of plain, electro, uh, plain gravitational waves, gravitational waves, class of plain gravitational wave solutions of Einstein's vacuum equation. There's also a generalization where you have an electromagnetic field in addition. So then it's a combination of a gravitational wave and an electromagnetic wave. But the more interesting ones are the pure gravitational waves. And they were later rediscovered by Ehlers and Kund in the 1950s. And they called them PP waves. And under this name, they are often quoted. So PP stands for plane parallel waves with parallel plane gravitational waves with parallel rays. Yeah? So plane and parallel. This means PP. We will discuss this class of solution in the, uh, in the second half of the course. And in the same year, the Viennese uh, yeah, mathematician Guido Beck also found an interesting class of solution. So these had plane symmetry. Yeah? So the wave fronts were planes, which travels infinitely extended, so in this sense a little bit over-idealized, and they travel through space and time. And they are, as the so-called, as the back waves, they are a class of cylindrical, cylindrical gravitational waves. Solutions of Einstein's vacuum equation. And this class of solution is usually called Einstein Rosen waves. No, I think they don't do this in English. So because this solution was rediscovered by Albert Einstein and Nathan Rosen 12 years later, and as usual, Einstein didn't care about literature research. Yeah, this was not his strong, strong point. He very often uh, found things and published them without checking if anybody else has done something, had, had already done something on this subject. There were a lot of complaints about uh, this from, from some of his colleagues. And uh, this is another example. So Einstein and Rosen uh, reproduced this solution in 37. They didn't check if this already existed in the literature, although this was a very well-known journal, so it would have been easy to, to find. And that's the reason why they are called Einstein Rosen waves, yeah? because the names Einstein and Rosen are much better known than the name of Beck. But actually, one should call them Beck waves. Actually, the Beck paper is better written than the Einstein Rosen paper, in my view. Uh, Rosen, I think uh, most of you know this name from the Einstein Rosen Podolsky paradox. Yeah, it's the same person who was Einstein's uh, yeah, assistant and collaborator for, for a couple of years in Princeton. Uh, okay, so, but this was just in the mathematical literature and uh, for quite some time it was not, uh, it was not uh, noticed by, by the uh, physics community. And then Einstein, yeah, and now I come to the Einstein-Rosen papers, which have a, have a funny history. Actually, the first version of this paper was written in 36, I think, or 37. Let me look up. Yeah. And the first version of this paper, so Einstein and Rosen, Albert Einstein and Nathan Rosen, an American, American physicist who came to Princeton uh, and worked with Einstein for quite some time. Then later he, uh, he uh, went to the... Uh, to the Soviet Union, and in his uh, later life, he lived in Israel. So Einstein and Rosen submit a paper to Physical Review, which was, a, or still is, the most renowned physics journal in the United States. And in this paper, they claimed that gravitational waves do not exist.
So what Einstein writes in this paper with Rosen is, what I have done in 1916 and 1918 was wrong. I used the linearized theory without realizing that this linearization, which is an approximation, produces artificial solutions. Yeah, it produces artifacts which are actually not there. If I use a full theory, then gravitational waves do not exist. And actually, this is an idea which was uh, around for, for quite some time, and uh, many people have discussed this. Uh, it's not quite easy to understand uh, what a gravitational wave is and why it really exists in, an, uh, in a coordinate independent way, because you might have the idea, okay, a gravitational wave uh, influences uh, the length measurements, yeah? So it stretches and, uh, uh, stretches and shrinks uh, 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 length. But now I use measuring rods in order to measure my length. And these measuring rods are also changed. Yeah? So if they change in exactly the same way by the gravitational wave, then I wouldn't see any effect. But this argument is, of course, nonsense. And we will discuss why it is nonsense. Yeah? So we will see if I have freely falling particles that a gravitational wave produces a change in their distance which can be measured. Yeah? So a gravitational wave is not an artifact of coordinates. It is really something which can be measured. But at this stage, Einstein was, uh, Einstein was uh, yeah, uh, uh, he was following this, this uh, incorrect idea and he submitted this paper to Physical Review. And fortunately for him, the paper was rejected. <laughs> yeah? That's something that had never before happened to Einstein. You know, now, nowadays we are all used to this peer reviewing process. Yeah? If you write a paper, we send it to a journal. What's the journal doing? The journal sends it to some referees. And the referees look at it and they say, yes, this is good, this can be published. Or they say, no, it is not good, it cannot be published. We are used to this. But Einstein did not know this procedure. It had never happened before to him. He was, well, he published either as a member of the Academy, of the Prussian Academy. He was a member of the Academy. So he just went there to the meeting and presented his paper. There was no refereeing process. Yeah? As a member of the Academy, he could present any paper he liked. Or he sent the paper to Annalen der Physik. The editor at this time was Max Planck. And what Max Planck did when a paper from Einstein came was that he accepted it immediately. Yeah? So it never happened to Einstein that one of his papers was sent to a referee. By the way, that's interesting. So when Einstein was completely unknown to the physics community, he submitted in 1905 this paper where he suggested that our ideas of space and time have to be modified in a drastic way. So you would expect that it would have been very difficult for him to publish this paper. He was not known in the community. He was working for a, for a patent office in Switzerland. Yeah? He was not at a big university, at a, at a well-known institute. So he sent this paper. Max Planck got it onto his table, and onto his desk. And what did he do? He accepted it immediately. Yeah? So it's really incredible. Yeah? So uh, many people uh, say it's, it's very difficult if you have an original idea which is out of the mainstream, it's very difficult to publish this. It's a community will not allow you to, to enter into the, into, the, yeah, into the community. At least in Einstein's case, it was completely diff different. Yeah, he was immediately accepted by the, by the community. Of course, he had his enemies, but this is a different story. Yeah, this was, uh, in most cases, it has some anti-Semitic reason and it was uh, uh, from, from prejudice. So the, the, most, uh, the most important, the most influential theoretical physicist immediately accepted Einstein. And he, he became famous at an incre incredible pace. So, um, so it, that's, that's the way he was used to it. Yeah, I submit a paper, it is accepted, period. And now he got a referee report from Physical Review. Actually, a very good referee report, a very careful, very detailed one. We know today who the referee was. It was um, H.P. Robertson, the one from the Robertson-Walker Space Times. And he really did a good job. He explained exactly why this is not correct and how it, the paper could be improved. But Einstein, in this, in this particular situation, he behaved in a somewhat untypical way. He really was offended. He said, yeah, that's, that's a nuisance. Yeah, that somebody, that it's nasty that somebody says what I'm doing is, is not correct. And he wrote a letter to, to the editor of Physical Review where he said, I'm very angry that you sent my paper to somebody without my, my admission. And I will never again send a paper to Physical Review. That's what he did. Yeah? He never again sent a paper to Physical Review. Uh, the, uh, the funny thing of the story is that um, a, a while later, Robertson visited Princeton. 
and he talked to Einstein about this paper without disclosing the fact that he was a referee. And then he convinced Einstein about this error. And then Einstein wrote a new version of the paper. Rosen had left at this time already for Russia. And this new paper is then published in, not in Physical Review, but in a completely unknown journal, the Franklin Journal of Physics. I've never heard about this in any other content, in, other, in any other context. And uh, in this, this is a completely different paper. Yeah? In the second paper, it's not saying that gravitational waves don't exist. It's saying that we have found a new solution for gravitational waves, yeah? and these are the Einstein-Rosen waves. So this was in 1933, 1937. So Einstein, actually Einstein wrote this paper alone. We know this, know this now, but uh, Rosen was on the, he was, was listed as a co-author, although he hadn't, he hadn't seen the paper. Einstein and Rosen publish a completely revised version revised version in the Franklin Journal of Physics. And in this paper they present what is now called the Einstein-Rosen waves, the cylindrical wave-like solutions which actually should be called Beck waves, or uh, if you like, Beck Einstein-Rosen waves. But the priority is with Beck. And as I said, Einstein never, never uh, again submitted a paper to Physical Review. He had published in Physical Review before. The famous Einstein-Rosen-Podolsky paper appeared in Physical Review. And uh, this apparently was immediately accepted without being sent to a referee because at least uh, Einstein didn't get a referee report. So maybe the referees said uh, immediately, okay, publish as it is, yeah. And, uh, but in his later years, uh, Einstein uh, published in, in other journals, never, never in, in physical review. Okay, so this was, this was his story about the existence or non-existence of gravitational waves. And well, it's, uh, it's kind of, uh, yeah, uh, how should I say, um, uh, maybe uh, uh, yeah, a kind of um, yeah. It, ma it makes you feel better, maybe, that also Einstein himself had some some problems with uh, really understanding what gravitational waves are. Yeah. So you, when when we discuss this question of why gravitational waves are actually measurable, although also the the measuring rods uh, are influenced by gravitational waves, then you are in good company if you have problems to to understand this. But I try my best to, to convince you that gravitational waves do exist and that there's not, uh, there's not such, a, such a logical circle uh, behind this. Okay, so uh, from then onward, from 1937 uh, onwards, then Einstein again believed in gravitational waves. Yeah? So then he, he never came back to this old idea. But this is, this is different from Rosen. Actually, I have met Rosen in 1980, I think was my first big general relativity conference. Rosen was there and Rosen gave a talk where he spoke about uh, his doubts in the existence of gravitational waves. Yeah? I, was a, I was a student at this time. I didn't really uh, understand uh, much about the topic, what was going on. But I realized very clearly that people in the room said, oh my God, this, people is, this person is, has really gone, gone senile now. Yeah? You, cannot, you cannot take him seriously. Yeah? So Rosen was, uh, he had, had very, very eccentric ideas in his, in his late years, although he definitely has written a, a couple of very interesting and very good papers. But his ideas about gravitational waves were, were strange. This was, was quite, quite, clearly, uh, quite clearly visible. He has also passed away since, since many years now. Okay, uh, the, yeah. The really interesting uh, story with gravitational waves that people studied them really in detail theoretically and that, uh, really, that they started thinking about maybe of observing them. This began in the late 50s. So this was uh, the golden era of general relativity, late 50s and the 60s, maybe up to the early 70s. That was when many new developments came, when, theor when, when theoretical physicists really became interested in general relativity, a greater number of them, much greater than before. And this also influenced the development of gravitational waves. And maybe the most 
most fundamental and most seminal paper of this time was the one by Felix Pirani, a British relativist who unfortunately also passed away recently. Uh, he, was, he thought about this question of how one can characterize gravitational waves in a coordinate independent way. Obviously, this is a fundamental question. Yeah, this kind of error, this came about because people thought in terms of coordinates. They wrote down a metric in terms of coordinates and they discussed it in terms of how the coordinates were influenced by the wave. And Pirani was, I think, the first who thought about the question, can I characterize a gravitational wave in a coordinate independent way? And, uh, and uh, that's what he did in this paper. So he gives an invariant, that's what I mean is coordinate independent characterization of gravitational waves. So that's something which allows you to say this is a gravitational wave and this is not just by looking at some invariant quantities, uh, invariant expression con constructed from the space-time. And very soon uh, after that, an interesting class of exact gravitational waves was found where this criterion could be applied to. And these are the robinson troutman matrix, which Robinson and Troutman Trautmann find a class of exact wave-like solutions. They are more realistic than the Brinkmann waves and the Beck waves because they do not have this uh, yeah, over-idealized symmetry. Yeah? Plane waves, where the wave fronts extend to infinity, of course, are a strong idealization. And cylindrical waves, where you have an infinitely long cylinder, so the wave fronts are infinitely long cylinders, they are also a little bit over-idealized. They have really spherical wave fronts. The robinson troutman solutions have spherical wave fronts, so they are more realisti realistic in this sense find a class of exact wave-like solutions to Einstein's vacuum field equation, and we will discuss them at the end of this course. Vacuum field equation. And at the same time, as I said, so this was important progress on the theoretical side, and at the same time, yeah, the experimental aspects of gravitational waves uh, entered. Uh, yeah, yeah, they, they, um, it was the first time that they, was, uh, that they were approached. As I said, Einstein had never thought about actually measuring gravitational waves, and most of his contemporaries uh, also thought that this is just a theoretical construction, but that one would never find them. And the first person who actually tried to measure gravitational waves, who built an apparatus with a, uh, <laughs> planning to observe gravitational waves, this was Joe Weber. Yeah? So he began in 1960, he was an American, originally an engineer. Actually, he was uh, strongly involved in the development of the laser. And many people say it's an injustice that he did not get the Nobel Prize for the, uh, for the construction of the laser. It has something to do with the fact that it can only be three always uh, for the Nobel Prize. Yeah? And for the laser, as you probably know, they decided for, what were the names? Towns and then these Russians, Prohorov and Bazarov or something like that. Yeah? So uh, Weber was not among them, although he was nominated for the Nobel Prize several times. And many people say he, yeah, his contributions were equally important than that of the other three. So this is Joe Weber begins his search for gravitational waves, really experimental search. with the so-called resonant bar detectors. Yeah, or for short, Weber cylinders. So the basic idea is incredibly simple. 
what Weber did was he constructed a big cylinder, maybe that size, one meter fifty or something like that, and diameter maybe a meter or so. Of uh, I think they were made from uh, aluminium. I'm not quite sure. Some kind of uh, of metal in any way, uh, metal uh, or, or alloy. And um, the idea was, so here's a cylinder. Now if a gravitational wave comes, uh, as, 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 uh, the best thing would be if it, if it would just come from the side. Yeah, if this is a cylinder, it should come in this direction. And then the length of the cylinder would change. And the idea was to measure this with piezo crystal, uh, piezo crystals, which were glued to the surface. Yeah, very simple idea. And many people said, my goodness, uh, this is absolutely hopeless. Yeah? You will not be able to, to measure gravitational waves with such a simple instrument. But Weber estimated the chances to actually observe something, and he was quite optimistic about this. So he started building these things in the early 60s. Uh, then he even sent one of these detectors to the moon. One of the Apollo uh, projects had one of these detectors with him. I think it was Apollo 17. I'm not quite sure. So they put this thing on the moon, but it didn't work properly. And, uh, and Weber claimed that he had discovered gravitational waves with this kind of instrument, but nobody believed him. And other people checked his calculation and said, my goodness, he is off by 10 orders of magnitude. Yeah, this is absolutely hopeless what he is saying. So, but he was, uh, yeah, he became kind of stubborn in his later years. And uh, I've also seen him at conferences uh, a couple of times. And uh, so he was said, I have seen gravitational waves. And everyone in the audience said, no, you have not. <laughs> it was a little bit, <laughs> it was a little bit uh, embarrassing. Uh, so he was, uh, obviously he was a very good engineer, but his physical background was not so very strong. Yeah, so he was, uh, he came from the engineering side. And uh, uh, yeah, his, uh, his uh, theoretical explanations of what he was actually doing, they are certainly a little bit questionable, to say the least. So this was the beginning of these so-called bar detectors. Some of them are still in operation. So nowadays, they are usually not cylindrical. You know, nowadays, they are, they are spherical, which has an advantage that the wave can come from anywhere. Yeah, you would always see it. And uh, they are much more sophisticated than these Weber cylinders, so they are usually cooled down to very low temperatures. And yeah, the whole, the whole apparatus is quite, quite sophisticated. So I think at the moment there's one in Brazil in operation. It's a fairly small one. And a bigger one in the Netherlands was switched off recently. But uh, so these, these, yeah, these uh, bar detectors uh, or resonant detectors of any shape they, are, they still exist, they still exist, and maybe they uh, become more fashionable again in the future. But the things which actually carried the day were the interferometric gravitational wave detectors, and they were suggested in a paper by 1963, in a paper of 1963 by two Russian scientists by the name of Gerzenstein, Gerzenstein and Pustovoit. Suggest. This was a theoretical paper. They didn't actually build something at this stage. Later, later they were built. But at this stage, they just suggested theoretically to use Michelson interferometry for gravitational wave detectors. And this is uh, yeah, the idea which actually worked out. So the LIGO detector, which made this measurement uh, in September 19, uh, uh, 2014, was such an interferometric device. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm frequently in, in, in Russia. I'm working together with uh, Russian colleagues. And they are always complaining, rightfully, I would say, that uh, the work of Russian scientists is not really um, properly acknowledged by, by, in particular, by the U.S. American community. Yeah? If you read the announcement from the LIGO, LIGO people, then this pioneering Russian work is almost never mentioned. Yeah? Although Russian scientists are part of the LIGO team. Yeah? So they are, they are collaborating closely together. But that the idea originally comes from Russia or from the Soviet Union at this time, this is rarely mentioned. And I really think that uh, this paper uh, from 1963 is in view of 
using interferometers for gravitational wave detectors is the most fundamental paper. So uh, these things were then actually built. So also these, uh, these uh, bar detectors uh, were uh, constructed also in Germany. So the German pioneer in this community was Heinz Billing, who passed away last year at the age of 102. Yeah, so he could have been a possible candidate for the Nobel Prize. Probably uh, the Americans will make this <laughs> among themselves, but uh, Billing would have also been an a person in the, uh, who played an important role in the discovery of, uh, in the development of gravitational wave detectors. But uh, as I said, he passed away, so he will certainly not be, um, so, it, so he cannot get, to get the prize. It will never be given uh, posthumously, as you know. So uh, Billing in, in Germany, he built uh, first uh, also these uh, bar detectors. He never measured anything. And he claimed also quite clearly that what, what Weber had, uh, had uh, claimed to have discovered actually were no, no gravitational waves. It was some kind of or whatever, but it was not a gravitational wave. And then Billing switched to, to the interferometric things. And uh, out of this uh, development, uh, which started in the 70s or so, uh, with Billing and his group, uh, came GEO 600, the detector here in Hannover. And at the same time, the Americans started uh, constructing LIGO. So this was uh, a development which started in the 70s. And um, when I joined the community, this was around 1980, my first conference, GR conference was 79. There was already talk about building a gravitational wave detector in Germany. And then it was planned actually to build it in Munich. Yeah, so you saw pictures. Uh, so. Uh, where this gravitational wave detector was, was drawn and you always saw the Alps in the background. Yeah? But then they found that uh, yeah, this area here near Hannover was uh, more appropriate for, for seismic reasons. And then actually GEO 600 was constructed in, uh, near Hannover and LIGO was constructed in the United States and, um, and then there was Virgo in, in Italy. And, uh, but everything began, began with, uh, with this suggestion from 1963. Okay, we will discuss these uh, detectors in, in detail later. Oops. Okay, let's wrap this up. So gravitational waves, I said several times, they have been detected in September 2014. Well, I should have said, they were detected for the first time directly. Actually, indirect detection of gravitational waves had taken place already earlier. I think most of you know this. This was um, the thing for which Hals and Taylor got the Nobel Prize. So the observations were made in 1974. Russell Hals, he was a PhD student at this time. Joe Taylor was his thesis advisor. And they together got the Nobel Prize in, when was it, 93? Yes, 93. Um, uh, interpret, let me write it this way. The energy loss of a certain binary pulsar they had found. What's his name? The name is PSR, means pulsar, and then comes a coordinate in the sky, B1913 plus 16. So 1916 means 19 hours, 13 minutes right ascension, and plus 16 means 16 degrees declination. So it's just the coordinates in the sky, and B uh, uh, refers to the, um, uh, to the epoch uh, at which this uh, these positions, uh, uh, these positions refer to. Yeah, so the, uh, the, the grid in the sky is, is time dependent, so you have to say which, uh, to which epoch you are referring. So interpret the energy loss of the binary pulsar as an emission of gravitational waves. So you observe a binary system, yeah, two stars orbiting each other. One of them is a pulsar, so it emits uh, pulses uh, at a very high 
uh, yeah, um, uh, with, with a frequency which is very stable in the course of time. And uh, from the observation of this uh, binary system, we will discuss this in detail later, you can deduce that the system loses energy. So the things come closer to each other in the course of time. And how is this interpreted? It's uh, interpreted as emission of gravitational waves. Yes, so the system loses energy. This energy is emitted in the form of gravitational wave, and that's the reason why the, things come, the two things come closer together. You don't see the gravitational waves. Yeah? There's no detector which actually says, click here, gravitational wave has arrived. Nothing like that. Yeah, it is just uh, the fact that we observe this energy loss and we interpret this as emission of gravitational waves. And actually, the way in which this energy loss takes place, so the function uh, as a function of time, fits perfectly well, the quadrupole formula. We will discuss, uh, we'll discuss this later. So it's a very convincing evidence, for the, but indirect evidence, for the existence of gravitational waves. And Hulse and Taylor got the Nobel Prize in 1993. So this is one of the few cases where somebody got a Nobel Prize for a PhD thesis. Yeah? The only other one I know about is Mösbauer. Yeah, this um, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, emission from, from gamma rays with, without recoil effect, so that you can measure frequencies with very high pr uh, precision, which is called Mösbauer effect. This was also the subject of Rudolf Mösbauer's PhD thesis. So if you are very lucky, if your supervisor gives you a good topic, then <laughs> you might uh, get a Nobel Prize out of your, of your PhD. Uh, actually, a famous case where somebody did not get the Nobel Prize for the PhD was um, for the discovery of pulses. So the person who actually did, what was the name of the lady? Ah, uh, my goodness, I'm getting old. It was a PhD student and uh, uh, her thesis advisor got the Nobel Prize. Well, he did most of the, of the, ev of the uh, evaluation of the measurements, so it's not... Uh, not, <coughs> not um, not without reason that he got the Nobel Prize, but many people said uh, the PhD student should have, should have shared it. It's a famous name, but my memory for names is so, so bad. Um, I'm getting old, sorry. Okay, so in this case, they didn't, uh, the Nobel Committee did not want to repeat this mistake, so in the case of, of Hals, uh, um, they, uh, they shared the Nobel Prize between the advisor and the student. So since then, since this time, actually, more or less everybody is really convinced that gravitational waves existed, but they had not been detected directly. And the direct detection, uh, yeah, the possibility of directly detecting them began in the year 2002, when the first interferometric gravitational wave detectors, and these were three, here in Germany, GEO 600, oops, in the UK, LIGO, which is actually two uh, detectors in two different uh, locations, and then Virgo in Italy. The first interferometric gravitational wave detectors go into operation. For many years, they didn't measure anything. Well, when I say they didn't measure anything, I don't mean that uh, the detector was just uh, silent, that it never, never registered anything. It registered all the time, all the, all, all the kind of, of, of uh, signals. So for instance, Geo 600 is near Hannover. It's not very close to the North Sea, right? But you can see the tides of the North Sea. You can see them in the measurements of Geo 600 there. Yeah? And if, uh, yeah, if somebody, um, uh, yeah, if, uh, if, if there's a little earthquake, fortunately we don't have big earthquakes here in the area, but there are always little earthquakes. And of course they can be registered with these kind of instruments. So the problem is to find something uh, in this general noise, which uh, is always there, to find something which is really a signal, a gravitational wave signal. That's, uh, that's a problem, not to see anything. There are lots of things to be seen in the signals. And uh, yeah, now we are almost in, in the present time. So just for, uh, yeah, for the sake of curiosity, I want to mention 
something which uh, probably many of you had uh, followed in the news. In 2014, there was an announcement of the discovery of gravitational waves, which actually was not correct. It was from the so-called BICEP2 team. That's an instrument uh, near the South Pole where the cosmic background radiation is observed. And the BICEP2 team incorrectly, incorrectly announced the discovery of uh, primordial gravitational waves. So they said, we have found a signature in the cosmic background radiation, which comes from gravitational waves, which have been created in the very early universe. And uh, people immediately said, um, well, this is not very likely that with this kind of instrument one could actually observe these primordial gravitational waves. It's quite likely that they exist. Yeah? Many people believe that they exist, but almost nobody believes that they could be detected with this kind of instrument. And then well, this was announced uh, with, uh, <laughs> with uh, yeah, very loudly and uh, the big press conference and... Uh, yeah, we had the, the, the spring conference of the German Physical Society at this, at this time when the announcement was made and uh, so there was uh, there was big uh, press conference uh, on this con uh, uh, during this, this spring meeting and um, yeah hot discussions and the end of the story was that it was just a misinterpretation of the observations yeah so the observation was correct there was this signature but it had quite a different origin it was just foreground yeah dust between us and the source of the, of the cosmic background. And uh, so these primordial gravitational waves have not yet been detected. So they, are, they might exist, but uh, they are not yet detected. But the real thing was, uh, so in February, February 2015, the discovery discovery of a gravitational wave event on 14 September 2014 is announced by the LIGO team. And this signal meets precisely the expectation from a merger of two black holes. Of approximately 30 solar masses each. So it was not a surprise that gravitational waves have been detected. It was not a surprise that black holes exist. More or less everybody was convinced about this before. But what was a certain uh, surprise was that they were in this mass range. Yeah? So at this time we believed that uh, there are supermassive black holes, just a minute, of millions of solar masses at the centers of galaxies and the so-called stellar black holes, which might have 10, 15, maybe 20 solar masses. But that something with 30 solar masses existed, and the two things merged, so together they gave something like 60 solar masses. This was a surprise. In this mass range, actually, nobody expected um, black holes to exist. There's a question? Just a question of correction. Are you sure that it was in February 2015? I guess it was one year later. I got the paper, and it was in January or February 2016. Ah, sorry, sorry, what did I write? Uh, I just shifted everything by one year, so <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> yes, of course, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Yes, thank you. So, okay, this is correct if it refers to the, to the, uh, to the year of the detection. Yes, of course, of course. It was about one year ago. It was a little bit too late for the Nobel Prize in 2016, yeah? 
actually, some of us had hoped that the Nobel Prize would already give, be given in 2016 for this discovery. But uh, yeah, uh, apparently the time was, was too short. So they have to, to check and counter check many things if they want to give a Nobel Prize uh, for something which happened uh, so, so recently. So uh, that's the reason most people say that this is the reason why uh, the Nobel Prize was not given in 2016, but we are pretty sure that it will be in 2017. It would be a big surprise if it would not be given in 2017. Well, why did they wait? for so long. Yeah? So the discovery was made September 2015. The announcement was February 2016. Why is that? Well, the reason is that the procedure is fairly complicated. If they detect a signal, then what usually happens is, OK, they analyze the signal, and then, they, um, uh, then uh, if it is promising, then they write a paper. And then the question is, was this really a signal, a real signal coming from the universe, or was it a so-called injection? Yeah? Because there are people in the LIGO team who from time to time inject the signal. Yeah, they, are, they are hired for this purpose. It's their job to do this from time to time. And the idea is, of course, that the people who do the evaluation, the data analysis, that one want to see if they are able to detect these this signals and to interpret them correctly. So when a signal arrives, then uh, yeah, these people who do the evaluation, they are always careful, maybe it was an injection again. There was one case where the paper was already written, it's four years ago or so, or a little bit more, uh, where the paper was already written, where the people were already hoping, now we get the Nobel Prize. And then there's an imaginary envelope which is opened, and in this case, in this earlier case, in the envelope it said, hey, hey it, was, it was us, yeah? we injected the signal, it was not a real signal. <laughs> But in, in the case of this, of this event, when this imaginary envelope was opened, uh, there was nothing in it. Yeah? So it was not an injection, it was a real signal. So um, many people in the beginning sa uh, said, well, I've often heard the sentence, uh, the signal is, is too clean for being true. Yeah? It's so obvious uh, what one expects from a merger of two, of, two, uh, of two black holes that it probably was an injection. But, uh, well, none of the person who did the injection uh, uh, confessed that uh, he did it. And, of course, the responsible persons very, very carefully checked if one of them had had the possibility to inject this. And they came to the conclusion that, that nobody had had the possibility to do this injection. It must have been a real signal. And then the paper was written. It has a long, long list of authors. It's a whole LIGO collaboration. And it appeared in Physical Review uh, Letters in uh, 2015, uh, not uh, 2016, February 2016. And as I said, there are several other events now uh, being observed, and we expect this to be, uh, yeah, a routine process. Yeah, that um, uh, that such events are measured all the time. We will discuss this particular signal in detail. Uh, so this was two, merge, uh, two merging black holes. The other one, the Boxing Day events, was also two merging black holes, not quite as heavy. And uh, this is also maybe kind of a surprise, because people had thought that the first events we would observed would be merging neutron stars. But until now, apparently, we have not seen a merging pair of neutron stars. That's something we are still waiting for. So maybe it's just a coincidence. Yeah? that uh, actually merger of neutron stars are more probable, but if you have just a few events, then uh, it could be uh, just, by, uh, just by coincidence that uh, black holes were, were measured first. Okay, okay I'm just uh, uh, a little bit over time, but I finished now this historic introduction, and we continue on Friday then with a brief uh, recap of general relativity. Okay, see you then.